You're listening to the SD Boolean Podcast. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our first ever in-house, in-vault SD Boyan podcast. Uh, very excited. We have some very special guests here today, which we'll introduce to you very shortly. I'm Chase Turner, CEO of SD Boyan. To my right here is Cole Keller, COO of SD Boyan. We have two special guests from the Royal Canadian Mint today, Tom Froggett and Lauren Whitmore. You'll learn more about them in just a minute. Uh, we're excited to get this going. Yeah. So let's talk, guys. Thanks very much, Chase. It's our pleasure to come see you guys here. To get us started, uh, go over your all's roles, tenure with the Mint, uh, what normally you overlook and, and work on, and we'll go from there. Sure. Great. I'll start off, Lauren. Um, so I'm Tom Froggett. Uh, I'm Chief Commercial Officer at the Royal Canadian Mint. I've been on board nearly five years, but I've got a 30-plus year mm. background in sales and marketing all over North America yeah. uh, and a bit in other countries in Europe. Um, and uh, it's been really exciting seeing... Uh, it's recent times really of yeah. all that interest in precious metals and we've really been uh, engaging with our customers and our partners and uh, doing a lot of in innovative things together. So, Lauren? Yeah, Lauren Whitmore, I'm Managing Director for Sales at the Royal Canadian Mint for our precious metal products and services. That includes bullion, the collectibles, our precious metal storage business, mm -hmm. our refinery and our listed products. Wow. Yeah. Great pleasure to be here and uh, looking forward to having a conversation. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for joining us. And you guys flew in yesterday. Uh, we got to go have a great dinner together, a uh, great conversation. And, you know, one of the things that we talked about last night is, hey, SD Boyne is not your regular, uh, you know, kind of company. We don't want to have a corporate, you know, dialogue that, that the viewers don't really enjoy. We really want to get into some things that we think the viewership will really find uh, interesting. So it's definitely going to be our, our, our goal today. With that said, you guys have come in. You, you toured the facility this morning. Before we before we move on, what was your what was your thoughts of the facility? You, you guys have been in quite a few, so I know you visit quite a few facilities. What, what was what was your thoughts here? Yeah, we were uh, really impressed not only with uh, the scale, the uh, the layout, mm -hmm. uh, the processes that we saw, the, the people that we met. So we had mm -hmm. a really good impression of what we saw today. So we okay. really appreciated that opportunity. Yeah. Security wise, how do we how do we stack mm. up? Hey, well, we have a lot of security at the Royal Canadian Mint. Yeah. You can imagine yeah. at both of our locations uh, in Ottawa and in Winnipeg, Manitoba. But uh, it was very impressive uh, to, to tour the facility and see the layer upon layer of security. What fascinated me was not only how modern SD Bullion's uh, facility is, is mm. the um, the leveraging best practices from other industries to mm. make uh, a differentiated. Uh, uh, processes in, in running your business. So it's quite impressive. Yeah. We appreciate that feedback. All right. So to kick it off, the, the one thing I took away from our dinner last night that left the most uh, biggest impression on me when I got back to the hotel room as I was digesting all of our conversation was how you guys are a, a, a different mint than what, like say in the U.S. we're used to the U.S. Yeah. mint and how they operate and how you guys basically from an enti entity perspective are very different. Can you go into that? Because yeah. I, I think that kind of lays the groundwork really for the rest of our conversation. Sure, sure. I'll, uh, I'll take that. So we're, we're more of a commercially focused mint. Um, actually, yes, we're, we're owned by the Canadian government, but we operate at arm's length from, from the Canadian government. And we actually have a profit mandate. So mm. all of our business areas are, are, we have to work in towards profit. So um, that's something that makes us more unique than a lot of other uh, government uh, agencies or federal corporations that exist. Having that profit mandate really makes us focus on being customer centric, yeah. as well as we have to balance a social mandate uh, that we do have um, a social role for the uh, producing Canada's circulation coins as well as coins for over 80 countries around the world. Yeah. But in Ottawa, that's our precious metals facility where we have an actual gold refinery yeah. and we produce all our, our products uh, wow. right through for investors, collectors, as well as uh, the financial uh, markets. So you guys produce coins for over 80 countries, you said, across yes. the world. Circulation yeah. coinage. Circulation coinage. So since 1976, we've had a plant in Winnipeg, Manitoba. Um, and that's where we've produced the Canadian circulation coinage. And with digital uh, payments increasing in Canada, yeah. uh, we've been selling our capacity to other countries. And uh, yeah. we've, we sell may, many of the countries in the Caribbean. Those coins are produced in Canada. 
Uh, we just finished a big contract for the Philippines where we produce a bimetallic coin of 20 peso, 1.2 billion pieces. Wow. Um, so it's been, it's been very important to balance our capacity. We have the skills and the capacity uh, to produce for Canada, but we also have the opportunity to support other countries that don't have mints. Yeah, at one point you were making uh, coinage for the for the U.S. citizens, right? For the yes, for, yeah, for the U.S. Yeah. government. It didn't go through. We'll, maybe we'll yeah. tell that story sure. uh, a little bit later. But yeah, definitely learned about the circulation coins last night. It was fascinating. What's some of the largest countries that you make coinage for that you know we would recognize? Well, we make coins for uh, you know countries like even New Zealand uh -huh. um, and, hmm. and a lot of African countries. Uh, We've just finished producing for, for Ghana. Um, we've produced uh, wow. this year. We're finishing off some production for Thailand. Um, so these are, uh, these are countries that don't have the, either the capacity to, hmm. to meet the demand because in a lot of countries around the world, unlike Canada and the U.S., where digital payment is becoming more yeah. and more um, widely used, uh, other countries like Mexico, for example, 94% of all transactions at wow. retail in Mexico are cash. Wow. Um, in in uh, in African countries, like even in Egypt, it's over eighty percent of and all the all the coinage cash. that's being used in those yeah. transactions. You yeah. guys are actually making as in the countries that we've yeah. uh, we've uh, won uh, contracts for. Yeah, and uh, yeah, and so these are uh, you know sometimes they have a mint, but it can't keep up with the growing demand of uh, cash usage mm -hmm. in those countries. Yeah, no, it's, it's it's fascinating because yeah, when you look at what you guys are doing, you guys are actually trying to make a profit you're operating sure the business as as an actual business crazy yeah. idea do you feel it gives yeah. you a little bit of a competitive advantage uh without speaking too much of who you would see as competition um you guys do operate in a way that seems to be more willing to capitalize on market opportunity do you feel like in the long run that's that's going to allow you to better serve uh, your end user? Yeah, I, I think Tom touched upon the, the customer service orientation, but yeah. also it's it's fueled innovation in order to compete in a marketplace. You have to innovate, you have to lead, and I think we've done a, a good job at doing that. We also have empathy and understanding of the customer dynamics. They're also seeking profits in their commercial yeah. organizations, so we can really sort of align with our customers along those lines as well. Yeah. Do you feel that the, because in Canada, you can go to some local banks, maybe not all, but some local banks, and you can buy collectibles. I know that's where you guys distribute quite a bit of collectibles. Do you feel the Canadian investor and collector is materially different from that American, or how would you compare them out of curiosity? I think there are a lot of similarities and there are some differences as well. So I mean, yeah. there are a lot of, on the collectible side, there's a lot of common themes across the two countries. We share geography and language and a lot of culture, but there are yeah. some unique uh, elements to, to each country. On the investment side, certainly the, the environment, uh, the economic environment we've been in, the geopolitical environment resonates, I think, across both countries as well. Yeah. Taking a step back here. Let's, let's talk about COVID. The last four years in this industry has been materially different than the 40 before it. So from your all's perspective, COVID hits, I assume six months in, there's a real reckoning with what is our strategy now? What does it need to look like? What were those conversations like on your all's side and what's been some of the outcome of it? It was, it was, if I think back, it was a pretty intense time. The whole world was wondering what to do and even governments were trying to get their head around who's essential, who should continue operating, mm. who, who shouldn't, you know. Yeah. And um, so as a leadership team, uh, we were on 24-7 uh, trying to deal with how, how are we going to transition through what's happening to the world with COVID, take care of our employees, our customers. Uh, and we had to understand if we were essential. And uh, in, in Ottawa, Canada, where we have the head office and the main precious metal plant for the Royal Canadian Mint, we actually have a gold refinery. And it was at that time that we realized that the mining sector was mm. essential to continue to operate in Canada, where we have uh, some of the best gold mines in the world. And we actually um, have contracts to refine that gold. So we, we never shut down the gold refinery. And uh, what wow. we did do, though, for the precious metals manufacturing, we shut down for two weeks. We, we created a protocol of how can we operate safely in a COVID environment. Mm -hmm. We had mirror teams. We, had, we went 24-7. We had everybody spread out so that smaller teams would work. Uh, and we actually canceled our collectible business for a number of months. And we focused mainly wow. on 
on uh, bullion. So we back back to the customer aspect. That's yeah, what that's, that's what the customers oh, wanted. Oh yeah, Lauren's phone was ringing off the hook. Uh, <laughs> the the whole world, the world's mints could not keep up with yeah. bullion demand for a number of years. So we ended up focusing. We realized how important it was for the refinery to continue to support the mines, and then the bullion production to support wow. our, our customers, and then right through to the financial markets, uh, the banking sectors, and so we really had to reprioritize uh, what was really important for the Royal Canadian Mint, its customers, its employees, and the shareholder. In that time frame, obviously, it was it was hard on our side to to get bullion. How are you guys sourcing the raw metal that you needed to fulfill the demand that you had during COVID? Well, I think uh, Lauren knows a lot about this. I think we're pretty fortunate. We've got a great team that sells our refining services to the Canadian mines. And so yeah. the, the access that we had to metal was phenomenal. Mm, uninterrupted. Uh, yeah. So we, and in the last number of years, we've been growing our expertise and our efforts and really uh, engaging with a lot of the, these Canadian mines. And that became a big priority push for us. And uh, Lauren and his team have done an amazing job uh, winning those um, those accounts. And and, and our, our refine, gold refinery is super busy. Um, so that was, that's part of it. You know, if there's one big lesson we learned during the pandemic is being vertically integrated and managing supply chains and all that's super important. So the fact that we were able to Absolutely. control our supply was uh, was kind of a big deal, and we think it uh, served us well. Absolutely. Yeah, again, another major difference between you and the U.S. Mint. We were talking last night. They don't even make their own blanks. Literally, they just strike the coin. Yeah. You guys have the mines, yeah. refine it, produce it. All right there yeah. in house. It's yeah, we'll, a full business model. Yeah, we'll do our blanking and then uh, we'll rewrap the coil with all the holes in it from from the blanking and then it goes back to melt. Right. So, wow. Uh, so so it's a continuous yeah. process. Yeah. So coming out of that, you guys clearly established there was more demand than you could possibly serve. Everyone saw that in the marketplace. To what magnitude? If you guys have looked at it and said, we, we feel like we missed out on this amount of business, maybe triple what you could have done. I mean, personally, we look at it as if we would have been uh, remotely prepared to the degree that we could have serviced it to 100% of whatever demand would have been, we probably could have done around six or seven times mm -hmm. the amount of business during that time period with Silicon Valley Bank and then COVID, things like that. Do, have you guys looked at it and, and assessed what your market opportunity was and made some decisions to address that moving forward? We've, I, I just tell a little bit, Lauren, uh, we did look at it, but we had our record years as well. Yeah. Uh, so a lot of the process improvements we did in production and the prioritization of what, what did we have on the floor that was going out was all done with the engagement and Lauren and his team had with, with our customers. Mm -hmm. So we, we prioritized the mix of what needs to be going out, what should we focus on, how uh, we added more shifts, things like that. But we also um, realized looking down the line, we didn't have a lot of access to, um, to silver that, that we would want to. So now what we've done is in the last uh, year and a bit, we're investing in a silver line in our Winnipeg facility where we produce the circulation coins. We're going to be doing our own blanks um, uh, on top of the mm. blanks that we do in Ottawa. But mm. now we're going to be uh, we're, we're dramatically in increasing our capacity for silver blanks. It's not as simple as just leaving a striking machine on a little longer, no, is it? No, huh? no it's, it's a big, big capital investment. It's a big sure. capital investment, and it's a whole new process. It's one that doesn't really exist uh, today. It's innovative technology that we have, okay. uh, we're establishing in Winnipeg, and will be operational probably by Q2, Q3 uh, of this year. What's the time frame to respond to increased demand? You guys say, we need more. How long does it take for you to feel like you're serving the market with more? Uh, we're extremely nimble now. We're rolling out, you know, production ready facilities mm -hmm. this year, like this quarter. And wow. so yeah. we're going to be extremely nimble. And I think the other thing to think about, not only is capitalizing on opportunities important, you know, uh, commercially for us, sure. but if you think of the end investor, I think an undersupplied market ends up paying too much for product. So the fact that Absolutely. we're able to supply markets allows us to change that supply demand dynamic. And I think that's good for the end investor as well. Yeah, we always think about that end investor. Yeah, it's one of the worst times to enter the market whenever there's this massive wave and premiums are, you know, up 5x. Mm -hmm. um, we're as frustrated with it as the end, end user is. I'm sure you guys are as well because we would be more than happy to sell more ounces yeah. at, a, at a tighter spread and service more people. Yeah. Another benefit of us investing in our, in our, our Western Canadian plant with the Silver Line is it's going to open up more gold capacity in our precious metals plant in Ottawa. 
So we'll take a bit of pressure off the silver and we'll add more mm. capacity gold. So that's going to, in the end, help our customers during those peak demands. Well, that's awesome. Yeah. yeah. Well, one of the stories from last night about COVID that was interesting, you guys actually had to defend your position that you were essential, right, to the Canadian government. So tell us how that went down. What was the time frame? What would have happened if they said you weren't essential? Yeah. Well, that was it, that was really a pretty dynamic time. It was all uh, it was all live, right? So uh, decisions yeah. were being made by even by governments. And so in Canada, we have provincial governments which were overseeing the mining sector. So it was more from that that perspective, which is like a state government, right? Mm. And so we were watching uh, every day what are the decisions that the governments were making. And that's when they made mines essential. So that was helpful. Mm. But then we realized that the mining companies need liquidity and so they get liquidity by delivering their dore to market getting it to ref us refining it and then out to the financial markets or into production for investment products so that the so those those were daily uh, decisions that were being debated daily and and we had to articulate it on how we would support the uh, you know our role in the canadian economy was really supporting the canadian mines right through to the financial markets to canadian banks and others mm. it's, it's amazing how it's all tied together yeah, yeah exactly that that was i think an epiphany for us at that time and re it really helped us with our prioritization of what are we going to do what do we focus on it allowed us to shut down the collectible production lines for for a number of months focus on bullion because the market was uh, demanding for mm -hmm. that investment. Uh, investors worldwide were very nervous yeah. and wanted uh, gold, wanted silver. Yeah. You guys and probably provided the most amount of material into the market during those times whenever it was really, really tight and people were shutting down from our assessment that it felt like the most widely available product was stuff that was coming out of your facilities. Yeah, we, we track, um, you know, market share and, and, you know, global share of market uh, yeah. quite closely. And we know that in 2021 and 2022, we were, in fact, the number one one ounce silver bullion coin and the number one one ounce gold bullion coin uh -huh. in the marketplace. and uh, In the world. Yeah, in the world. And wow. so yeah. the ability to be able to supply that market was really key. And it, hopefully, you know, we believe it served investors well. What, percent what percentage of that was U.S.? Uh, a very large percentage of it is it's our largest yeah. market for yeah. sure. Um, we have some large markets in in Western Europe, and our domestic market as well is mm -hmm. is also of meaningful size. But uh, we really do play. We do look at regional market share, and we really do play well really across the globe. And I think it's one of the few coins where that could be said. The other thing, I maybe you talked about COVID on the financial services side. If we think back to that time, a couple of other things were happening. Tom alluded to the fact that you know people needed financial security. So as mm -hmm. equity markets were under strain, people mm -hmm. needed diversification assets. So we were able to fulfill that financial services requirement. The other thing was there was a shortage of uh, bars to deliver to the COMEX exchange, if you recall. Yeah. Yep. And we were, a refinery was able to provide those uh, deliverable bars to the marketplace, which really served the banks well. Let's expand on that a little bit, because it's really fascinating. A lot of people don't understand that market dynamic. What, From your all's perspective, what did you see? What did you change? Because they changed the requirements for the exchanges, 100 ounce to allow larger format bars. Right. At this point, I believe this would have been after, but there was also the Russia-Ukraine conflict, which presented a, a big hurdle because a lot of material into the LBMA comes out of Russia on the gold side. So what was your all's uh, perspective on all that? Well, in the initial times, it was, you know, kilo bars and 100 ounces for the COMEX. So we yeah. have always produced those. So we did prioritize our product mix for you know, those with open contracts that needed to deliver physical. So we really changed our product mix to respond to that need of our customers. Yeah. So, and then obviously when it, it opened up, that uh, everybody could play. But uh, yeah, we thought that was a really critical moment where a number of institutions could have really been under strain if we weren't able, along with the rest of the marketplace, to deliver those wow. bars. Wow, think about that. If they just said, no, we're not producing kilo yeah. gold bars, these contracts will just operate as as the market sees fit. Wouldn't be cool. Amazing. Yeah. yeah.
Hey, SD Bullion fans, we've got more of today's podcast coming up for you in just a minute. If you're enjoying today's podcast, please take a second to toss this episode a like and subscribe to the SD Bullion podcast for future episodes. And if you're really enjoying today's podcast, we encourage you to check out some of the incredible products from today's featured guest, the Royal Canadian Mint, over at sdbullion.com. By the way, did you know that SD Bullion is giving away some free silver? Seriously, it's free. SD Bullion is giving away 500 of their one ounce Silver Tree of Life coins in the Silver Tree of Life Monster Box sweepstakes. And who doesn't want free silver? Entering is super easy, so check out the link in the description down below for your chance to win a Monster Box of silver from SD Bullion. So Lauren, one of the things I definitely want to get into while we have you here today, because we hear it on the phones every day at SD Bullion, uh, four nines fine. You guys, I think, were the first ones to do that, and you're still doing it. What's the difference in four nines fine versus three nine three nines fine? Does it really matter from an investment standpoint? Uh, we have to answer that question every day. So, what is the official answer from the mint? Well, first of all, just going back to the comment about having a refinery gives us the capabilities to produce the, the, the gold in the first place to that purity. So we're a world leading refinery. So we have actually, you know, innovated three nines first and then four nines and uh, even five nines. So we think, you know, if you're investing in gold, gold's what you want in your product. So we think that <laughs> level of fineness um, is a differentiator, but also in certain countries are tax implications. If you're not pure, if you're mm say, uh, you know, 22 carat, the, mm -hmm. it has tax implications in s certain jurisdictions. It's really important for us to be a coin that travels around the world and has liquidity in every market. So that was another reason why we uh, chose that level of purity. And you guys are the only ones to produce 5.9 fine gold product. You do it on small format with one ounce. You do it in large format as well. You were talking about the 100 uh, kilo, 100 kilo, which is amazing that you have a 100 kilo product and it's made out of 5.9 fine gold. Yeah, again, we invest heavily in innovation and R&D. And so, uh, you know, we have a world-class refinery. We thought that was important. So not only do yeah. we do bullion products and collectible products in five nines, we also do five nines grain. And that's sometimes wow. required for certain industrial applications as well. Wow. Yeah, a lot of times customers, whenever they're buying gold, they're curious, like Chase was talking about, does purity matter and silver as well? They ask that. And they find the five nine fine product and that piques their interest in one of the messages that we relate to them as if if this mint in this refinery is capable of producing five nine fine gold imagine how good their four nine is going to be yeah. like you can't surpass that quality it's it's legitimately unparalleled in the marketplace yeah and certainly our four nines product is high four nines nearly five nines yeah. so we make sure we have lots of margin in our purity yeah uh the other question we get every day is why should I buy a silver maple versus a silver eagle yeah and why is a silver maple uh, have a lower premium than the Silver Eagle. Who wants to field that one? Okay, so um, a couple of things. Let's start with the two ones that rhyme. So okay. purity and security. We talked about purity already. Yeah. You know, we think that's uh, certainly a differentiator. Security is really important. If you think about it, uh, people buy bullion primarily to protect their financial interests and mm -hmm. to, um, if you're if you're protecting your financial interests with bullion, you want to make sure you're bullion is protected as well. So we want to make sure that we have advanced security features and we've, we're really innovative in that regard. So we have a number of features, including radial lines. Mm -hmm. We have a uh, micro engraved laser mark that's hard to duplicate. We actually have a, a digital uh, verification platform called Bullion DNA that actually allows you mm -hmm. to use a special machine and actually verify by going back to our servers that it was in fact produced by the Royal Canadian Mint. So yeah. when you're putting your wealth in those things, you want to make sure that uh, your, your investment's secure in a secure product. The other thing is, if you think about it, if you want to be a counterfeiter, if you want to counterfeit something, you yeah. want to do something that's easy to counterfeit. I mean, so we yeah, want to yeah. use that as a deterrent. Yeah. yeah. Where do you f see most of the counterfeits coming from, or is it all over? It, it comes from different places at different times, and sure. it's, it's difficult to predict where the next one's going to come from. Wow. So we make sure we've got a bulletproof platform that isn't uh, you know, situation specific. Yeah, a lot of mints have really struggled with that. Uh, where they, they think they have technology, they maybe have invested in a minimal degree, but they they find the marketplace uh, notices quite a bit of fakes. And we haven't seen that with your all's products. Uh, we don't expect to because you guys have invested so heavily. You also, in I believe in 2018, released Mint Shield mm -hmm. or, or came to market with the, the announcement that Mint Shield is a part of your productive process. A lot of customers, um, if they've been in the marketplace for a while, 
They understand, you know, spotting is something that naturally occurs on uh, produced silver product. And that was one thing you guys were trying to address there. So uh, would you mind speaking on that? Yeah. So again, staying with the theme of protecting your bullion. So this yeah. is just another way of protecting the surface of your silver coin. So the milk spots or the white spotting was something that was uh, common across, yeah. not that common, but prevalent yeah. enough that it required a solution across all bullion coins. So we thought we would, again, continue to innovate. And we found a way to produce this mint shield uh, protection, surface protection. And uh, we actually tested it extensively. We actually simulated aging to make sure that the uh, protection would endure. And in mm. fact, our experience since we launched that has been extremely positive and it was really very effective. Yes. So how long did that take? You mentioned aging. How Do you know how long the process took from start to finish when they you know, first started doing the R&D? It was denominated in years, not weeks or months. Yeah, yeah. Um, the exact one I don't know. And we can also simulate aging. Once we apply that okay. technology, we can simulate aging in a you know a lab environment as well. So when we first go out to the marketplace, we you know feel confident that it's going to be effective for a mm -hmm. long period of time. So you guys don't use whiskey barrels to age your silver coins while no. you're figuring out mint shield. No. You have a different technique to age them. <laughs> exactly. That's just at the holiday party. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's incredible. We're not against aging whiskey, though. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's incredible to hear how much investment you guys have made in effectively your customer with security and anti-counterfeiting things, as well as the mint shield. Uh, it really protects the end user and gives the investor confidence that what they buy today is going to be worth that plus some uh, in the future. Yeah, we try to put ourselves in the place of the end investor. Without them, clearly, we don't have a business. So we're, we're playing the long game, and we want to make sure we have long-term customers that see value in the product that, uh, that we deliver. Yeah. yeah. Do you feel like your silver bullion product's the best in the marketplace? Best Absolutely. value? Absolutely. I think, you know, if you look at value relative to sure. price or premium, again, we continue to invest in innovative uh, security, other features, yeah. uh, fineness and all of that. So uh, we really do think from, and we, we of course like our own design as well, but from a design, sure. purity, security point of view relative to price, we think we offer tremendous value in the marketplace. And the marketplace has validated that with, with the numbers. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, globally speaking, the maple, silver, absolutely gold, even more so. It's just so widely accepted. The value proposition is overwhelming. It's a tremendous product at a great price. Uh, people love it. Yeah, and the other thing that sometimes people don't think enough about, again, um, it's an investment product. At some point, you need liquidity. So having a product yeah. with a lot of liquidity right. is really important. So if I'm wanting to sell back my coin, I want a popular coin that people are willing yeah. to buy at a good price because they know they can resell it. And I may be in uh, Cleveland, Ohio today. I may be in Singapore tomorrow. I yeah. want to make sure no matter where I am in the word, uh, world, I have a coin that's popular and liquid in every single market. And I, I think we're quite unique in that regard. Yeah, there's one thing we tell customers pretty often. You want to be in the market. You want to participate in the market, but you don't want to be the market. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing that you always have to weigh. You, there may be something a little bit cheaper, but if, if you can't go find a buyer for it uh, relatively easily, be it us, sell it to SD Point, fine. Yeah. Sell it to your local coin shop. Uh, it's it's fine. It's whatever you elect to do. But if you can't find a buyer, then uh, if in the event that you do want to sell, then that's a problem. Right. Agreed. Yeah, we want to make sure, not necessarily that we're the cheapest, but that we offer the best value yeah. long term. You know, one angle I was not expecting to hear from our customer base, but uh, what, what happens is you have a lot of people that will say, uh, look, we're, we're buying gold and silver because we don't trust the U.S. government. We don't trust the U.S. dollar. They'll buy uh, the Canadian maple leaf because it has a face value. In the worst case scenario, they'll go across the border to the north and use it there. I was pretty surprised to, to hear that from the customers. I just wasn't expecting that to be to be a reason to, to, to go with the maple leaf. Interesting. Yeah, they're offshore. <laughs> Uh, near shore. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. They're near shore plane. Yeah, they're offshore plane and the near shore plane. Yeah, right. yeah. So you guys have, of course, large format bars. We see over there, we have a kilo gold bar. There's 100 ounce silver bars. And then there's things as small as the maple grams. So uh, that's been around for, I think, about six years, the maple gram, maybe a little bit longer. Uh, but that's a unique value proposition to a lot of investors that want to start with gold. They want to maintain the divisibility. Uh, but they also want quality and a brand they can trust. So that's got to be something that you guys are proud of and continue to want to serve the marketplace. 
Yeah, absolutely. And you can see it's also the gold maple branding and, and design yeah. as well. And it, it serves a number of purposes. It could be for an investor that needs to parse it out in small bundles of liquidity. It also may be for somebody who wants to gift it to their children in little parcels as well and start them on the investing journey. So it has a lot of different use cases that I think is quite unique in the market. What do you think other uh, producers of bullion get wrong? Um, well, I think, I think um, certainly the supply side we talked about, like we think that um, investing in being able to supply the marketplace with mm -hmm. a, a product and to be a reliable supplier. So you maybe we don't always have enough. We, we're trying to have enough, but you know when you're going to have it. So mm -hmm. I think from, a, from our direct customer's perspective, being a, a reliable mint, and I think everyone, every mint has had different experiences. And I think the last few years really tested the, the metal of, uh, no pun intended, of, of many of the producers. Yeah. So I think that's something that's really important. I think um, the failure to invest in innovation and technology um, probably is a failure of some other mints as well. And I think having that customer focus and really thinking about if I were the investor, why would I buy this product? Yeah. Always coming to the table with that orientation, I think is really important. And I'm not sure it's universally embraced. Yeah, it's an interesting discussion with you guys because you're so retail customer, end user customer centric. That's not a conversation that we get to have a lot. So, you know, it's it's exciting to think about the possibilities from a marketing standpoint. I know we've come up with some, some coin ideas uh, already that, that we can come up and bring to the marketplace. Uh, those things are super exciting. We know what the customers want. You guys are very interested in serving the customers. So I think we'll have some really good success in, in the future bringing those uh, programs to market. Let's talk about collectibles. You guys spend quite a bit of time uh, doing collectible products as well. That's a, a good revenue stream and, and profit generator for the Mint. Um, what do you see the role of collectibles in the marketplace uh, and serving, obviously, local Canadians? It's a little bit different than the average American, but um, there's certainly a huge base of people. That's their entry point into the market. Mm -hmm. If we go back to um, our discussion about covid we learned that uh, with all those folks at home, with a lot of time in their hands, the collectible business, mm. uh, not only in precious metals, but in, in all areas of collectability, huh. really had a dramatic growth uh, uh, period during, during COVID. So, so we had a lot of uh, new customers getting exposed yeah. to or re-exposed to collecting precious metals and numismatics in particular. One thing that we did do um, just prior to, the, uh, uh, to the COVID was we did do some research on, on bullion, you know, what gets people in, in bullion in the beginning and found a lot of it was a new demographic, a 30-something that mm. started, they were gifted when they were young and then they now as a young professional, they're interested in diversifying wow. their portfolios. Yeah. But they also had an appeal for things that were collectible as well. So there's this kind of new investor collector that we're monitoring and trying to appeal to. And that's when we started the premium bullion line where we can offer... Uh, core bullion product with a bit of attributes of numismatics mm -hmm. of yeah. collectability like a privy mark or a mintage yeah. so that gives them an kind of an entryway with a little bit of something special so um, and we've really focused our collectible strategy on premium products and that's kind of going in the direction of the investment aspect of the collectability mm -hmm. as well as the themes that uh, people like mm -hmm. to see and you guys produce roughly around 100 collectible products annually we right some about, of those are yeah we do about, we used to do a lot more uh, uh, years back and we got feedback from our customers that it was too much. And yeah. so we do about 110 different themes. Um, a lot of, some of them are Canadian centric, but there's others that have, you know, global appeal as well. And so um, we found kind of a sweet spot where 110 themes uh, were able to sell not only domestically, but uh, in Europe, in, in mm -hmm. Asia, and in, in the U.S. as well. Sure. Speaking of Europe, uh, last year Germany passed uh, a law. They started taxing silver at 19%. Is that correct? Was it 19%? That's right. There was uh, uh, something called the margin scheme, which did allow uh, advantageous tax treatment for silver bullion. And that, uh, that was reinterpreted okay. um, for uh, providers outside the EU. And so that really had a, uh, an adverse impact mm -hmm. on the demand for silver because Again, back to the idea that it's an investment product, the premium yeah, sort right. of matters. So yeah. on an after-tax basis, it was uh, 
definitely a negative influence in terms of demand. Now there are all kinds of, it's a very fluid situation where there's a number of reinterpretations that are being solicited by, hmm. you know, interested parties. So it, things continue to evolve in that market, but we still continue to see that as a, a really important market for bullion and for us. Yeah, absolutely. Because Germany itself uh, before that would have represented Certainly in Europe, uh, maybe a majority of the total demand. Would you guys agree with that? It's our second largest market. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Next yeah. to the so, U.S. And, it was, yeah. and then it was basically yeah. put on ice. So did they have a pretty big impact on sales immediately for you guys? or? Yes, it, it did have an impact. And, of course, it happened just as the market conditions in general were cooling a little bit after yeah. an extremely yeah. high period of demand. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, it did certainly. And I think it takes a while for people to work their way through interpreting it and to react. And, sure. you know, perhaps the market will normalize a little bit and perhaps the interpretations will change. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, certainly it was a very, an overnight, really uh, dramatic impact. Yeah. What's amazing is if you think about it, the, the people that there's still plenty of actual uh, investment in those territories. It's just a reduction by a large percentage, but there's still a lot of dollars in it. People are effectively voting with their dollars saying, Gold and silver, or at least silver, right? Because with the nineteen percent tax, is worth more than twenty percent of the premium on silver itself. So that kind of uh, provides a window into the mindset of the average uh, investor over there, and they've experienced uh, different uh, developments with their currency over the course of the last hundred and fifty years relative to the American. So it's interesting. You could you could argue they have. Uh, better experience, better context, and a, and a more grounded uh, perspective on precious metals and their role in the future. Yeah, I think it continues to be an important asset class, and I you know do believe that it'll continue to have a, a really strong role in people's portfolios. Yeah, I was I was going to ask has has the sales recovered? Have, have people gotten used to paying the nineteen percent? Said okay, fine, I'm just going to to pay the the tax and get the metal. Have sales kind of rebounded at all from the, the initial dip it took when the law first passed? Yeah, we did see flurries of demand, but I, I, st I still think it's going to take some time for, to sort it out. And as I said, it's fresh and there's lots of reinterpretations and pre people pursuing strategies to, to make sure they optimize their situation. So I think it's going to take some time for a full rebound, but I think in the fullness of time, the, the fundamental uh, business case for precious metals will still be there. Yeah, we talk a lot about small investors with collectibles and the individual products. I think what you guys do as well, or better than anyone, probably by far better than anyone, is understanding how to provide value to the large investors. So whenever we have a customer calls in and they want you know, a kilo gold bar, I'd say on a ratio of four to one, they want an RCM kilo. They don't want really any other brand. They want a Canadian kilo, or if they're buying... 500 ounces of gold, they want gold maples. So uh, I know that's probably music to your all's ears, but uh, I'm sure that's intentional. Can you speak to some of where you feel like you service uh, the highest net worth folks? Yeah, yeah, we do. And we, again, we know this through our customers who service those, uh, those entities. But we also have, you know, other businesses where, you know, high net worth people may, uh, family offices and institutions you know, may decide to use our products, but also have us store it for them. And, and you know, there are those other, being a full service mint with a strong brand and a, and a long history does attract, you mm -hmm. know, the large, more sophisticated players in the marketplace for sure. Yeah. And even I think knowing that, that the majority of gold is, is mined in Canada mm -hmm. and is refined by us, um, the, even the environmental processes of the mining in mm -hmm. Canada are highly regarded um, so I think there's a lot to be said by those investors getting that that uh, confidence be behind Canadian mines right through the Canadian refiner uh, being the Royal Canadian Mint. It's not that long ago where there were some issues in the refining business yeah. where it had you know big implications. If yeah. you don't have um, gold that's going to you know be accepted and recognized and have liquidity over the long term, then you really haven't achieved your objective of having precious metal. So I think people have confidence in our practices, our ethics, that they're uh, secure in the knowledge that they're going to have liquidity down the road. Let's, let's dive into that a little bit deeper. Gold that is accepted, um, specifically um, gold coming from some regions of the world that are sourced unethically, uh, that is a major concern that a lot of people... It's not a major concern of ours per se. It's a major concern of a lot of investors. And if you have uh, the benefit of 
perspective and zoom out, like you said, uh, that does represent a constant risk in this marketplace. So are you guys really proud that a lot of your material does come from Canada? And how do you assess risk in the refining side? Because that's usually where it comes. Yeah, our uh, risk management protocols are very rigorous. We have the advantage of, of being adjacent to, uh, you know, we think the best uh, mining gold mining jurisdiction in the world. So we have, it's a bit of luck involved, to be perfectly honest. But sure. we've taken advantage of building a business around that and leveraging mm-hmm. it. We're also implementing technologies that uh, tracks the provenance through a blockchain-based wow. technology to make sure that we can actually prove the provenance of the metal that uh, we produce in our products. And that's a really emerging area in the marketplace. I want to be clear, there are other very good actors, and I sure. think there are industry yeah. associations that really do enforce. Yeah. Um, but I think um, it's it's becoming clearer and clearer who the good actors are, who the bad yeah. actors are, and yeah. who we're trying to figure out. It's difficult. It's expensive yeah. to go vet that. It just yeah. is. How do you guys assess partners whenever, obviously, you have more demand than you can get from Canada? So when you have to go outside of Canada to get metal, how do you assess your partners? Uh, what does that process look like? Where does it? Where does most of it come from? Well, first of all, the overwhelming majority of our gold comes from Canadian gold mines. So we're 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 actually able to be self sufficient for our uh, bullion products, um, for the coin business, and for a large part of the bar business by using our own gold. So, mm. but in terms of assessing partners, typically we would look at. Um, other partners that either maybe a mine in a different country that has uh, Canadian ownership or a company we've done other business with. So somebody that we know deeply, trust deeply, and we do our homework as well. But we're very judicious in choosing our feedstock. Mm-hmm. And again, we have the advantage of being adjacent to a really good source of uh, material. It's critical whenever you're evaluating your options as an investor to have counterparty confidence, especially in large format. Every investor cares about that. But mm-hmm. if you're buying couple kilo gold bars. Uh, your primary concern outside of premium and liquidity is going to be... Authenticity, uh, chain of command. Yeah, it's just going to be confiscated. Yeah. Yeah. So that's that's uh, good to hear that you guys uh, invest. What, what, what about on the silver side? Uh, most you, you, you have most all, most all your gold for the gold bars and coins comes from Canada. What about the silver side? So we, uh, because of the size of our bullion business, yeah. we are not fully self-sufficient in silver. But what we've done is we've established a fairly narrow but deep um, supply chain uh, using institutions to source metal from known sources. We only, we've selected a few brands that we're really comfortable with. Yeah. We're continuing to look at expanding, you know, that uh, that spectrum of suppliers, but we're very judicious in choosing them, not only knowing um, you know, where the metal comes from, but also the chain of custody, the counterparties we're interacting with, and mm-hmm. the other business we do with those counterparties. So it's a, it's a pretty big deal for us. Mm-hmm. Our brand is everything for us. We want to continue to inspire the trust of investors. So we're, mm-hmm. we're very careful about that. Is that what you feel that the average uh, investor, call it, they've been in the marketplace for a year, do you feel like they don't put enough proper weight on the counterparty and the brand whenever they're assessing their product opportunity? Yeah, unfortunately, these things only come to light when it's too late and there's, yeah. a, and there's a problem in the marketplace. And I guess some of the problems are recent enough that we think that it may resonate a little bit strong, more strongly than it had in the past. Sure. But I, I think it's often uh, overlooked, to be honest. So last night over dinner, uh, founder of the company, Tyler Wall, was there. He's here in the building today. Uh, you guys got to meet him. But one of his questions was actually a common question we get from customers a lot, which is, why does the Canadian mint use a monarch from england on their coinage you want to fill that one sure sure well it's it's been uh for many many years and it's because we are a constitutional monarchy so the head of state for canada is actually the monarch and uh, we've had uh, queen of elizabeth since 1952 on the obverse of Canadian currency mm. and uh, and m- much of our product, like all our bullion products, we have the monarch. Um, and since 1952, we had four different images of Queen Elizabeth uh, on our, mm. our obverse uh, of the coins. And then with her passing, um, uh, Charles III is now the, the monarch. And so uh, so our government recognizes the, the monarch as the... Um, Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the king, king. He's the king of Canada as well as king of the UK and, and the Commonwealth, and uh, the government made the decision to continue that tradition of uh, having the monarch uh, on our currency. 
And that's got to be a massive transition, right? To go from, it seems simple, one obverse to another obverse, but it's monumental. It was, it was huge. And it was um, a long time in the making. You know, we we're getting ready because every, virtually every product that we've produced, yeah. uh, being uh, currency, uh, had to have the monarch on it. So, um, so over the years, we've had experience changing the obverse uh, design because of the aging of the queen. So, so the dyes and all that have changed, the artist renderings, things like that, and the engravers. Um, so we, we had the skills and abilities, but we had to get ready for, um, for the king. And so we actually went to our database of, uh, of hundreds of artists, and we invited them to compete for the opportunity to design the obverse of oh. King Charles III on the Canadian currency. And we, we had a really terrific uh, engagement with the artists. Uh, in the end, we had a cross-functional committee of engravers, of product managers, of creative folks, marketing folks, decide which one would be the best uh, wow. uh, artist to perform the, um, the design. And uh, so then we, we chose that design, worked on, um, on the engraving, the tooling, um, but we had to actually send it to Buckingham Palace to be approved by the king. So once it was approved by the king, then it went through our... Uh, our process for the Canadian yeah. government to approve the currency, the new currency for Canada. What right. sort of uh, feedback do you guys receive whenever you send something off to the palace to get approved by the king? Is it no problem? We we never look at it, or do they have some strict feedback? You don't. You don't. Uh, well, we did have some strict feedback on yeah. what parts, uh, how much of the design we could use. So we did get some direction from from mm. from Buckingham Palace. Uh, but we did have some real positive uh, feedback as well. Um, and uh, what's interesting is a kind of a fun uh, uh, historical fact is each time the monarch changes, um, they face the other direction on mm. the obverse of the coin. So yeah. Queen wow. Elizabeth faced looking to the right, and wow. now King Charles is facing looking to the left. And it's wow. kind of a, a historical um, yeah. uh, change that would go from monarch to monarch. Yeah. Uh. Earlier, we were talking about different coins you guys create, and I was asking you, as we, we talked last night at dinner, how it takes, uh, what, 3.2 cents to make a penny, or 3.5 cents two, to make... I think 2.3 cents. 2.3 cents That's to make I've a heard. penny I don't these have days. The facts, yeah. American penny. Yeah, yeah and, you, and you had a, a dollar coin on you from, from Canada that you mm -hmm. guys had just come off the press, and I was asking you, it seems like it would be much more expensive to make a, a coin than a piece of paper. So why, you know, why would you use coins over paper? And then that led us into a conversation about what you guys were doing with the U.S. Mint that only right. almost went through. So you want to talk about why coins versus paper uh, right. circulation and yeah. then the, the, the story about working with the U.S. Mint? Sure. And, and if we use the Canadian example, um, many years ago we had a... Uh, paper banknote that was the one dollar mm -hmm. Canadian uh, currency and yeah. we had a two dollar banknote as well which I don't think you guys have ever had in the U.S. a two dollar banknote uh, not not much in circulation <laughs> no. yeah. it's, it's, it's a novelty yeah. so so that was that was really critical during the times but then with um, with the banknotes they had a certain lifespan and a lot of people didn't know that the paper banknotes lifespan was about six months in circulation and all the handling six months the wear and tear yeah six months so the wear wow. and tear of it the banking systems would essentially collect, you know, those that have been through uh, a lot of the wear and tear, and they would they would go, you know, back to be recycled, recycled. And, wow. and then new ones. That's why the um, the banknote production facilities, uh, the U.S. Treasury, is uh, you know constantly printing because yeah. there's so much there's demand. That's for why the it's notes. constantly on. We have, <laughs> we have a different perspective on well, it. As I go to the grocery store. He's talking about the store. dollar bill, not uh, the uh, yeah. <laughs> no, it's just that that. That it doesn't last forever. Yeah, that's yeah. that's the point, right? So yeah. it has to be replaced. You're saying every six to twelve months, you right? You would have to recycle. Paper. You know, yeah. with the plastic banknotes, it's a little longer now. Yeah. But the fact that you can have coins that will last, uh, you know, 25, 30 years in circulation and do their job mm -hmm. of currency that needs for the small retail transactions. Yeah. So so that value proposition of a coin is significantly dramatic. And since Canada changed the $1 and the $2. We've saved Canadian taxpayers and Canadians over $500 million wow. um, in cost, in true real costs by not having to recirculate and wow. reproduce banknotes for the $1 and $2 and have the duration of the coins, uh, you know, support sure. those re small retail transactions for, for decades. Um, and that's a value proposition that we take to other countries. Yeah. Like I was saying in our plant in Winnipeg, Manitoba, we produce the Canadian circulation coins 
every year, but um, with the digital payments, it's it's less now, but it would still steady. But we have more capacity, and we sell that capacity to other countries. And we've produced coins for over 80 countries around the world uh, over the years. And right now, we're working with some central banks in other countries, tra transitioning the Canadian example of uh, uh, you know their lowest denomination banknote transitioning to a coin that will last 20, uh -huh. 30 years. And, and the U.S. government saw this and reached out to you? Why, why didn't they just do it themselves? What? Well, I, uh, the details of that, I, I don't have all the details, but I do recall in 1999 and 2000, there was a, an experiment in the U.S. where there was a commem commemorative $1 coin. Okay, yeah. And uh, we were producing blanks, and, and it could have been with the capacity that the U.S. Mint had in their plants were full. Sure. Um, so we produced... Um, some of the $1 blanks for the uh, U.S. Mint, as well as, I think, some five-cent blanks, like a few hundred million okay. um, wow. to support the, uh, the U.S. Mint. And uh, the one thing is that uh, in many countries, um, you know, we'll produce blanks, but sometimes we'll strike for the country. But some countries require, like the U.S. does, that all coins be struck in, in, in country. Yeah. Yeah, in so country. we would have produced, in 1999, uh, 2000, we actually... Uh, um, supplied blanks to uh, United States Mint. Wow. Something you don't think about that often, the cost of actually producing circulation mm -hmm. coinage, but it's absolutely critical to be cost-effective there, efficient. But if I got this right, you're telling me the American government pays 2.3 pennies I don't have to those, generate a I, penny. I can't. I can't. Uh, what, what would the Canadians I don't have charge us, by the way? We might take this to the White House. <laughs> yeah, let's start negotiating. Yeah. Yeah. You can look in the media. Google it in the media, yeah. in the U.S. Yeah. media, and I think somebody's done research on how much it is, but it's, wow. I believe it's more than a penny to make a penny. Yeah. So. Wow. so, so it's, it's possible somebody's viewing knows this, but so maybe back in 1999, 2000, the U.S. government was testing the idea of turning the dollar into a coin and maybe yeah, for whatever think, reason it didn't work. And, right, and I think there's some articles on that and yeah. I think it was, it's the um, the desire of the U.S. citizens uh, wanting to maintain paper. a $1 paper banknote. I yeah. think that was, they, they were very, um, very much fixated on that and were open to that transition yeah. um, back in the day. But like over 20 years ago, we invented a technology. We were very much known as innovative and we, instead of taking the alloys like pure nickel to make nickels, mm -hmm. we actually started uh, a plating technology. So today, we, uh, we blank steel uh, into coins, and then we put it in a plating process, and we actually plate nickel over the outs mm. outside of the coin to give it that nickel finish. And that dramatically reduced the costs of... Uh, of coinage, uh -huh. and uh, so the alloy content is wow. nowhere near what it used to be in, in the seventies and uh, Got it. and beforehand. Yeah, makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, innovation. Y you're a profit house, right? You have right. a profit we have a mandate. Profit mandate. Yeah, That's yeah. right. That's yeah. right. It's so, funny how that works. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Money motivated. Yeah, we can't uh -huh. be supported by taxpayers. You know, uh -huh. we have to. Every year uh, since I've been at the mint, we've been giving um, back uh, tens of millions of dollars in uh, profit back to the uh, Canadian. Canadian people, you know, through uh, uh, the, um, the the profits that we generate and the dividends that we pay back to the government. Wow. What's interesting is we talked earlier about, about some of the bullion features, the security features. Some of those were inspired by work we by had done on the circulation wow. side. So there really are synergies across the different businesses that we do. So we all participate in the precious metal space, obviously us as a retailer uh, and you guys as a producer. What collectively can we all do better to serve the end user going forward. We've had a good few years. Uh, everyone's proud of that. Uh, we've been able to build bigger, better facilities, offer more product, but there's still a lot of work to be done to add value to the end user and bring in more people into the space and educate them about metals. What what do you guys see as your role in that and what are you doing to uh, accomplish that? Yeah, I think uh, primarily we have to take care of the core customer for sure. You know, they're, they're the ones who've been been uh, with us for the longest time period but um, as demographics start changing and you know younger people are coming into um, into the investment market we need to help them understand mm -hmm. you know what are the opportunities what uh, you know what is investing in precious metals and mm -hmm. so we launched uh, a product line after we did some research where we found that there's a younger mm -hmm. demographic that's interested in investment but they don't really know quite how to go about it they got they were gifted something so we made this product 
Uh, I used to call the team and say, we have to do something like Bullion 101, you know, just help them understand yeah. what it is. So this is our silver maple leaf. It's just, it's our core product. It's a, It's got a mintage and a preview mark to make it a little yeah. interesting. Um, but on the back, what we did is we put a QR code where you could learn more. So got with it. the younger demographic out there who are used to getting more information, sure. scanning a QR code, it yeah. takes you right to the w website where we have a campaign. We've been doing more and more marketing. We call the campaign of uh, advertising for gold, love gold. We have love silver. We're doing love platinum. And it really talks about the basics of investing, what's it about, what, mm -hmm. how do you get liquidity out of it. Um, so th that's, I think, the efforts that we can do is to yeah. really try and educate, Education. like you're saying, yeah. uh, call the, the younger demographic out there or those that don't know how to go about. They don't know all, you know, your, um, uh, how to, your, your places where you can get sure. the channels of buying, um, of buying precious metals. And I think, it you know, with websites, it's yeah. been more open. But I think there's a lot of opportunities to teach and learn. And mm -hmm. I think that's that's from my perspective. Lauren, you probably have something. Yeah, I think in addition to the education and certainly the emergence of e-commerce in the precious metal space mm -hmm. provides a platform to disseminate information and make sure people get the right in information. Um, some other things that we've sort of discovered through our own research, and we work with people like the World Gold Council who's done some research. Mm -hmm. It's about inspiring trust. Yeah. Can I, so I think it's about having both products and producers you trust and retailers that you trust. So we think there's going to be a sort of a flight to quality in the in the bullion space. So Absolutely. we all need to make sure that we're part of that group that's uh, that's a trusted uh, ecosystem for people that are interested in precious metal, particularly people who are new entrants. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there's some inertia maybe to invest. And if you inspire trust and transparency and educate, it's going to, you know, go further in terms of opening up the marketplace and give other people the opportunity to, to diversify their portfolios through precious metal or perhaps even uh, decide to move into, you know, collectibles because they're yeah. on the same website and to, you know, continue to, um, you know, enjoy precious metals both as an investment product and a, as a hobby or a gift as well. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, for us, that's speaking our love language. Uh, as you guys know, we, we started as a, basically a blog about gold and silver. The, the, the founders of the company are silver and gold bugs themselves. Um, basically at SD Boy, we really pride ourselves on trying to educate. Uh, we see so many new people coming in the market every day. It's an old industry. Uh, there's some really, really bad actors out there in our industry. And uh, I, I know for us, uh, we're really taking it personal. And it's why we're doing videos like this. We're going to get more engaged in video to try to connect on that level with people, to make them more aware of if you're, if you're new in the industry, here's what to avoid. Mm -hmm. You know, here's what not to avoid. Uh, because unfortunately, uh, you know, you can find yourself in some bad situations with some people that uh, use very scrupulous marketing efforts to sure. get people in their web and uh, you know take take advantage mostly it's targeted to the elderly because I, I, I think yeah. a lot of the younger generations watching YouTube you know they're they're engaged at this so we're you know we're, we're always trying to come up with ideas to how we might combat that because unfortunately a lot of the bad actors are targeting people that are 60 years old plus that don't have access to the internet that can't really double check you know the information these people are telling them on their phones but yeah I mean collectively I think that is that is one of our calling cards. Is it's it's our role to help educate people. It's expensive, you know. It's, a, it's you know, difficult. People lose their life savings and yep. uh, get in really bad situations if they find themselves on the wrong side, not dealing with people like like yeah. us. And so transparency is critical. You guys see it as well. You talked about evaluating, you know, retailers or evaluating mm -hmm. people that are distributing product in the marketplace. We view it the same way on, on who's producing product and who's trustworthy and who can meet the needs of our customers because we're not going to stop trying to serve the marketplace and bring people into the ecosystem, educate them, be transparent with them, offer really good value on a two-way basis that includes on the buy side as well. That's one way that the marketplace in general uh, underserves customers is on the buy side. Uh, that shouldn't be such a problem. It's relatively easy to transact on a two-way basis, have good process in place, test material, sell it on a secondary market. But education is the key. It can be overwhelming whenever you come into the space and you say, okay, I want to buy metals. How do I do it? Uh, that You'd think that'd be really easy, uh, and there could be a couple – information sources where you get all your questions answered it's a pretty deep topic at the end of the day so you got a lot of ground to cover and we got a lot of work to do to continue uh, accomplishing that yeah guys i want to thank you again so much for spending some time with us today traveling down here 
again being the guinea pig in our first uh, podcast here uh, in house. And so, uh, out there, you know, if, if, you, if you like the material, give us a like. If you have, please give us some feedback. Uh, let us know how we did. Let us know what topics we missed. Next time they're in town, we'll make sure that we cover those. And uh, yeah, we just appreciate you guys viewing uh, today and uh, safe travels back home. Thank Thanks you very much, time, you. Guys. Merci beaucoup. <laughs> <laughs>